Hey, in this video I'm going to be explaining how to install Jobson and the Jobson UI. What I've done here is I've got a clean copy of Ubuntu and installed it onto a virtual machine. And I've installed a couple of text utilities like Emacs and Gedit. But apart from that, there's no dependencies installed on this machine. So this is as close to clean as you can get when it comes to operating systems. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the Jobson GitHub page, uh, go to releases. And I'm going to download the tarball for Jobson. You might also notice that there's a deb file here so that you can install, install Jobson as a package. And that will probably work on Ubuntu or Linux Mint in a lot of cases, or Debian for that, for that matter. But what I'm going to do is install everything manually just so you can see how to do it if you're on something like Mac OS X. So if I download this tarball here, and then it's downloaded, what I then need to do is extract it. And what this does is extract a run script, which contains essentially um, a call to Java with the jobs and jar, passing all the arguments over to it and the jar itself. And if I open a terminal in this folder, uh, what I should be able to do is just run Jobson. But what you'll find is that if, if you're on a particularly fresh operating system like this one, Java won't be installed. So you might need to install Java. Uh, D, I think it's called default JRE in Ubuntu. So this is just going to install Java now. It might take a minute or two. I'll cut if it takes too long. Okay, good. Now if I try to run Jobson, I'll see that it will come up with some suggestions. Let me just clear the screen here. You'll see that it'll come up with suggestions. <clears throat> so it's got server, check, new, generate, user, validate, run. I'll explain what each of these do, do a little bit later on, but what you need to run first is Jobson new demo. That's going to create a new deployment in that downloads folder. And what this has done is basically create all the files you need to run a jobs and server. So you can should now be able to run a jobs and server by typing jobs and serve or server uh, config. And this should just boot the server. <clears throat> now, what's happened here is it's just booted the HTTP REST and WebSocket API. So there is no user interface here. But if you wanted to test to make sure this is working before you moved on, what you can do is uh, open another terminal and you can use curl to basically send a message to it by default it's on port 8080. You can see that, okay, yeah, it goes through to the server. It's coming up with a 404, but ultimately, yeah, the signal's going through. And if I wanted to do a proper request, I know for myself that there's a one called v1 slash specs. Right. And you can see that, okay, now it's responded with something. Authentication isn't enabled by default with the demo deployment. So the server's running, but there's no user interface. So the next step is to get the user interface running. So what I'll do now is I'll go to the Jobson UI project. Again, go to a release. And I'll download a tarball of Jobson UI. Sorry, I just need to adjust my headset there. And then that'll download into the downloads folder, just as Jobson. And I'm going to extract everything. And what's inside this folder? It's just a set of static web assets, just JavaScript files, HTML files, the kind of thing you find on any web server. And what you need to do is host these on a standard everyday web server, such as Nginx. So what I'm going to use, what I'm going to use is Nginx, and the reason is, is because I've already written a guide on how to do that in the main README page, which if I go too fast right now, you can follow, and hopefully it'll go through it step by step, kind of how to do it. I might race ahead a little bit for the next minute or two. What effectively I'm going to do is install Nginx, so sudo apt get install wrong password very short password let's see nginx is installing it's all setting up yep that's all okay then i'm going to make sure nginx is running and you can see welcome to nginx that's cool then the next step, again, if you follow in the guide, it's going to say create a virtual host file in the Nginx configuration folder. So uh, what I'll do there is I'll go to, um, I use get it to open a file. So sudo get it, so etc, Nginx, sites available. I'm going to call this site Jobson UI. 
And it's going to open a text editor for me for this new file. I'm going to paste this in because I know it works, but I would recommend you read through this line by line. But basically what this is doing is, is explaining to Nginx how to host the UI, what port to listen on, how to forward requests to this jobs and server over here and so on. So if I now uh, paste that in and I save that, close it. Now that's in the sites available for Nginx. The way that Nginx works is it has a folder called sites available and a folder called sites enabled. And the way that you enable a site is by soft linking uh, from the sites available folder. So now if I go to the Nginx folder again, Nginx sites, this time enabled. That's going to list all the enabled sites. You can see default in here, which is this um, Nginx page you see here. I'm then going to do sudo ln link in sites available jobson UI as jobson UI. All that's going to do is create an entry in this folder that points to that configuration file I just installed. And then I'm going to tell nginx to reset or reload the configuration file. And hopefully it should be happy with that. If it doesn't say anything, it means it's happy. Uh, again, I'll click reload here. It's still the same because I'm not listening on port 80. I'm listening on port 8090 if you look through that configuration file. And what you'll find is it'll say uh, 404 not found. Uh, so in this case, the reason it's not found anything is because I haven't installed the assets yet. So I need to go back to my downloads folder where I unzip this jobs and UI stuff. And I need to copy these word Nginx listening. Now in this default configuration, it's going to host them from var slash var slash www slash jobs and UI. So that's where I'm going to install these files. So uh, I'm going to quickly go to this folder, um, create the necessary folder. So uh, sudo, oh, in fact, I'm going to do it from this CD downloads. Yeah. Maybe I'll do it. Sorry, my uh, virtual machine runs very laggy with a keyboard, so it does occasionally bounce around. So I'm back in the UI folder again. Uh, I'm then going to make the directory to host the assets. So it was var slash www slash jobson UI. I'm just going to make that. I need sudo to make a folder in this www folder. And then I'm going to copy everything in that folder in this folder to var slash www slash jobs new i. So I'm just installing all the assets into the server folder. That should be okay. And now if I reload this page, they should now point to the right assets. And as you can see, okay, I've got UI. So what these steps are basically done is set up an Nginx server uh, with the right configuration. And basically what my configuration does is say, serve up the UI assets from that folder but if any requests hit the server that begin with slash API, they need to go over here to the actual jobs and server. So you can see as I move through now, there are requests coming through to the jobs and server. So now we've got the two things connected. And now we should just be able to run the demo spec and everything should work. And that's it basically. So the whole server now is set up, including the user interface. The next steps now are to start installing specs for your particular jobs. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to just do it straight from the console. So what I'll do is I'll browse to um, the Jobson folder, so Jobson 0.0.2, um, and I'm just going to move this window up just so it's in the middle of the screen. It's a bit annoying, but it's at the bottom there. Uh, I'll maybe get a little bit bigger as well. Oh, sorry. So from the Jobson deployment folder, which has all these jobs folders and config and all the rest of it, I can start running Jobson commands. So if you type Jobson, I'm prepending it with a dot just because I haven't installed it system-wide yet. You can see that Jobson's got a few commands here. And what we're going to use is a generate command, which is a way of generating the necessary folders and spec files for, for jobs. So if I now go Jobson generate spec my spec, you'll see that it'll create some folders in here, but ultimately it'll create spec slash my spec slash spec slash uh, dot yaml. So if I go uh, my spec, spec.yaml, you'll see that these are the spec files that I was demonstrating in a demo video. And by default, uh, the, the, the actual script doesn't really do a lot. 
Um, I mean, you can quickly run it through a browser if you'd like to make sure that, you know, it's definitely generated it and it's working. So this is the generated job spec. In fact, the script is just generated. Uh, yeah, sure. It's asking me to build a query. I'm just going to select a column and you can see that it yeah, runs. It just dumps everything out into the standard output. It doesn't really do a lot. So next thing to do is just make it do stuff. So uh, what I'm going to do is start editing the spec file. So I'm going to open the spec. And I'm just gonna maybe add, uh, maybe I'll just edit one of the example ones. So I'll, let's just call this first name, as in the example I shown in the video. First name. Uh, I'm gonna get rid of a default and description, and I'm gonna get rid of the other inputs for now. But if you're curious about what inputs jobs and supports, uh, as I develop it, I'll add all of the supported inputs into a generated spec or the demo deployment at the very least, so that you can see what you can and can't do, basically. Uh, um, hopefully what you'll see here is, okay, it's running echo and it's not got any outputs yet. But I'm gonna say arguments is uh, inputs, the keyboard lag still, first name. So at the moment, it's just a spec that accepts one input it's going to run echo, which is the standard command line uh, application. And the first argument is going to be a first name provided through the UI. So now if I go to it, what I'm hoping is, yeah, it's asking me for a first name, Adam. I run it and yeah, sure enough, it puts Adam in the browser. So hopefully you can see that editing the spec is updating in the UI fine. The server's handling it okay. You know, nothing really funny going on. Next thing to do is maybe add a script and start actually getting stuff running. So. Uh, let's just add a Python script. I'm just going to call it script.py. Uh -huh. And I'm just going to put the usual boilerplate at the top here. So user slash bin slash python free. And I'm just going to have a Python script that just writes hello world in the folder. And then I'm going to edit the spec again. Uh, and this time I'm going to add it, update it to then run Python instead. Uh, it's not using the arguments, so, but I'll just keep it here for now. Uh, and one thing is that we now have an extra file in this folder called script.py. Now, when, when it actually goes to run the program, the way it, the way it drops and works is that it copies all the dependencies into a runtime folder for the working directory. And if you go to WDs here, these are the working directories that jobs and is used to run every job. In a lot of cases, they might be empty. But if your job happens to have written something, such as this output file here, or has um, maybe requested files as an input, all of them will be written into this folder. So what you need to t tell Jobson in the spec is to copy that um, that Python script file into the working directory. And the way you do that is with, a with the dependencies field. And if you're not too sure about uh, how you're going to remember all these things. Just remember that the demo uh, specs that are generated by the generate command will always have every feature, even if they're just commented out. So it might be best to just generate kind of a placeholder spec so you've got something to refer to. In fact, I'll, I'll do that now. So if I do jobson generate spec temp, for example, just because, um, and then I go to my uh, specs folder again, and I open that spec. I should now hopefully uh, be able to put them both side by side. If I'm ever unsure about something, I can just check this file here. You see, okay, dependencies, ah, so that's how you write it. So that's how I'm doing it usually. If I, I'm, a, I'm very forgetful. So these are just little tips. Uh, and the file that's copying over is script.py and the target is script.py. And what you need to do is, in this case, tell Python to run the script. So the way that Python does it is that you provide the script as a first argument. And now hopefully, if I open the browser again, I should be able to run it. Uh, the first name isn't being used in this case, and you can see it's running Hello World. So again, just building up the spec, adding all the inputs I need, running it, testing it out. There's nothing wrong with doing things in an interactive way. So the next thing I'm going to do is uh, update this, the script again, I guess, and maybe just make it write an output again, just to kind of demo kind of how that workflow would work. So uh, script, and in this case, I'm gonna make a write and output. Now it might be that, um, 
you've already written a you've already written a command line program and it already writes outputs and it already takes arguments in particular order and so on and so forth. In that case, you can just skip right ahead to writing the spec. If you if you understand kind of how things are working at this point, you can probably skip ahead a minute or two in this video because at the moment what I'm doing is just building this up bit by bit just so you can see kind of how things build up into a more and more complicated system. What I'm going to do now is uh, open a file. Uh, Again, like a keyboard. Oh my god. Some file for writing. So, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm telling Python to just write a file. And again, I'm not too sure about how. Jobson needs to know what the outputs are in order to know how to persist them and save them later on. Now you might think, what's the point in that? Because it's saving stuff in this working directories folder, right? But there, there is a point to that. At the, at the end of execution, Jobson will copy all these output files into the actual uh, jobs folder, which is at the moment a persistence layer. So if you click this 9416 vwrap job here, if you go to the actual job folder, you can see 9416 vwrap, blah, 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 blah. And if you look at, here's all the data it's saved. So you can see it's actually saved as standard error and standard output, but you can also see that it saved that file. So I can actually safely delete these working directories after the fact using something like a cron job and the whole system will be fine with that. The reason they stick around and the reason they're written and and they're kept, although you can tell it to, to save to the temporary directory, is just for debugging purposes so you can see exactly how the system's actually running. But anyway, back to the actual spec here. So uh, what I've just done is told my, uh, in my script, I said I've written a file output. So I need to now write a new key, which is the expected outputs. So I need to say expected outputs. Again, uh, just keep an eye on this uh, demo spec, because again, it's got some examples of what sort of values you should put for these. So ID, uh, I'm going to call uh, some output.text. This is the idea I'm giving it in Jobson. Uh, path written by the application is some file with that text on the end. And I think that's enough. Maybe I'll add a name, some lovely file. And hopefully if I run that, that should have given um, Jobson enough information to, yep, you see it's uh, persisted it. It's appearing in the output list now the files there as you'd expect basically. Uh, one thing you might notice actually is that in a, in one of the other jobs it was embedding the image into the output so you see uh, with one of the demo jobs maybe it was the first one I ran here it actually embedded it in you can you can actually tell Jobson to embed any output you want directly into the browser be aware of how that might affect performance though so so do be aware of that because it could end up embedding like a massive image or something like that but but if you know what you're doing you can tell jobs and to embed any output and the way that you do that is again uh, you go over to expected outputs here and you need to send metadata to the browser this is data that jobson doesn't touch but the ui does and the ui specifically wants a value called embed true now that isn't documented particularly well because it was only added very recently, but if you save that and then you run a job, you're basically telling the browser, how about having a go at embedding it? So now if I run it, you see, ah, you know, it's embedded the actual text straight into the browser. They don't have to click the download button, although of course if they click the download button, that still works. So hopefully um, at this point, uh, with the server setup, the UI setup, and you can generate some specs, you're in a kind of position where you know you you can start actually developing your own job system um, without too many problems. Uh, the next things I'm going to do are basically to explain how to set up authentication and how to have a much tighter kind of development cycle. At the moment, it's been semi-manual where I've been writing a spec and going to the browser, pressing submit, and obviously that's kind of annoying if you're a developer to have to go through a user interface every time you want to run something. So I'll quickly run through some uh, tips and tricks to do that. So the first, so the first thing to get out of the way is authentication. So if you generate a uh, demo um, workspace, it won't be authenticated by default, but you can enable it after the fact. So don't worry about having to make a whole new workspace. The way that you do that is from your workspace folder, uh, you go to the config.yaml, which is the config for the whole server, and you can change this guest option here. You see how there's multiple options, guest, basic, custom. I'm gonna add basic. Custom is where you write your own Java class. I wouldn't recommend that for most users and I'd ignore that for now. But if I turn on basic here and I then go back to the jobs and server and I reset it. 
Now, if I go to the user interface, what should happen is it will ask me to to authenticate. Now, the problem is there are no users installed at the moment, so there's no value, there's no magical values or anything I can enter in this to log in. There just isn't any. So the next thing you need to do is add a user. So the way you do that is again you go back to the Jobson folder where I was generating, I'll keep this up here again, where I was generating specs and so on. And there's another command here called Jobson. And again, if you just look at the command list, there's Jobson users. Uh, and then there's users add and then password. In this case, we're going to go add. And again, every time you're not quite sure about command, just, just don't type it with any arguments. It'll always try to explain what it does. So Jobson users add, and you can see that what it wants is a login as an argument. You see there's also a password argument so you can set a password in this call rather than having to set it afterwards which I'm going to do now because I'm lazy so Jobson users add password I'm going to go for the least secure password ever and I'm going to have my login as Adam and that's that, that that's completely fine uh, so that user is now added so now if I go to the actual user interface I should be able to go Adam type in my ridiculously insecure password and I'm in and it's completely fine. There's nothing wrong with that. You might find that the user doesn't update in the top right straight away. That's probably just a UI bug or something. But for the most part, it should be fine. And when you run a job at that point, uh, if you're logged in, I'm going to just run my demo. You should see that, yeah, it still runs. And yeah, now it's being run by an actual user. And the way that you add more users is you just keep doing this. So you keep on adding more and more users. They'll have to obviously provide a password. It's not an amazing system, to be honest with you. It needs to be improved. But hopefully it's enough for kind of small teams where, you know, it's not a, bit, it's not a big deal that you can't use a big central authentication server. But I do have other authentication methods planned in future releases, but they're not here right now, basically. So at this point, um, the login is set up. Um, the jobs are set up. Um, what else can I show? Uh, well, another thing is I can quickly show how to develop things directly in a console rather than relying on going through the user interface. So if we go back to the spec file I wrote over here and the script, what I can do is from, again, from the Jobson workspace, again, I'll drag it up. Um, what I can do is I can tell Jobson um, to generate a request for that spec, and it'll fill it with some placeholder text. So if I do that now, Jobson generate, okay, Jobson generate request, okay, followed by the spec ID, and I called that this, this spec my spec. You can see that what Jobson's done is it generated a bunch of JSON, which is basically what the request would look like if it came from the browser. And then what I can do is save that somewhere using the standard bash syntax, so request JSON. I'm just going to save it in my Jobson folder, and I'm going to open it in my text editor. I can see, okay, it's a request to get my spec. It's got a name. And as a developer, what I do is I just set up what I know to be a, a relatively reasonable kind of request. So name, um, some job, uh, first name, uh, Adam, or something. And then once I've actually set up, oh, I forgot the end. Then once I've actually set up the request, if I ever want to run that request against Jobson without going through the user interface, there's another Jobson command called Jobson run. And again, all the documentation pops up if you're not quite sure. Jobson run request.json in this case. And what this does is it runs the entire application of requests through the entire jobs and stack, hiding all the logging messages, and then it pipes a standard output from that job straight into the console as if you were running the, the actual script in the console. And the reason this is quite handy is imagine you're developing a huge spec and a huge script. It might be that you have a, a console window over here or you've got an Emacs console open or something. You can just basically uh, edit your script, you know, if you're not quite sure about it having a few two exclamation marks, and then you can rerun the command and hopefully you can see that everything updates. Uh, through the console, and that's just a, it's a much better development cycle than having to constantly go through the user interface. Um, if you're not quite sure about what Jobson's doing, uh, I believe oh, I haven't added it yet actually. There, there will be some support added for adding a verbose command, which will basically show the entire console. Unfortunately, this version doesn't have it, but there is an internal version that does have it. 
But hopefully that is enough, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully that is enough uh, to see how you can develop a spec without having to constantly go to the UI. It still it also applies uh, not just for script, sorry, but also to the spec. So if I want to update something in the spec, um, I, I, I really don't know which what actually. Um, maybe I want to add an extra argument um, or something like that. When I get to run this request, it will also use the new spec. So let's say, for example, I, I had some typo in the spec. Uh, and I, you know, I wasn't quite sure what problems that was going to cause. You can actually see that it says unrecognized field, expected inputs, uh, and six known properties. So we'll try to help you out. If there's any kind of invalid strings in your spec and you just want to validate it, again, this is a really nice way of validating it without having to kind of deal with loads of weird UI messages. Uh, there's one last jobs and command I'd like to show you, which is jobs and validate. Uh, and again, um, you, if you're not sure how to run it, just again, just type it with no commands. Jobs and validate my spec. Ah, ah sorry, jobs and validate. <laughs> I didn't even read my own documentation. How terrible is that? Jobs and validate spec. Yeah, and then uh, my spec. And what this will do is it won't require you to run a request through the stack to get the error message. It will just check that the spec is valid. And again, it's saying the same thing, that there's a typo and these are the things that these are the allowed fields and so on and so forth. So if I was developing a spec, I might run that command. Just quickly fix stuff. So expect to expect expected. Well, again, hopefully this will pop up in a validation error. I didn't really save it. Expected inputs. Hopefully this is fine, yeah, validate doesn't come up with any error messages. So hope, hopefully that's enough um, kind of information in terms of development tools. Uh, so with what I've shown you in this video up to now is basically setting up a server, uh, which is this thing on the left hand side, just as a local install. Then I've shown setting up the user interface using an Nginx web server, followed by generating a few specs using the jobs and uh, command line and hopefully that's clear enough for developers to work with. Hopefully it's not too complicated or anything. Uh, and then just some extra tips and tricks for developing against jobs and without it being a huge headache. And that should hopefully be enough for people to start running their own jobs and deployments. Uh, and I will probably in the next few videos, because uh, I plan on doing a regular series of videos, in the next video uh, I'll probably be explaining the ins and outs of security uh, because as I've uh, Got kind of sifted through the comments from last week's video. A lot of people are concerned about, well, what kind of attacks can you do on a server? Could people do shell injection attacks? You know, this sounds a lot like CGI. CGI had lots of problems. Hopefully by the next video, I'll be able to address some of those concerns and point out where the issues could be if you were running a huge jobs and deployment on the open internet. But for any kind of internal deployment, I don't think you have to worry about that. One thing you do have to worry about though is, and it's made very clear in the user interface guide, is that this guide, oh, virtual machines being laggy again, sorry. This guide um, doesn't uh, handle encryption, right? So this server, this Nginx server you're setting up doesn't have encryption enabled. And when you browse to it, you'll notice it's not encrypted. Now, you will need to enable encryption. And the way I'm not going to pretend that I know the best way to do that, but because you're using a very standard web server, in this case, an Nginx web server, you can literally just Google, how do I add, you know, how, how to encrypt Nginx server. And I'll give you the most up-to-date information, much more up-to-date than my video can give you. Uh, I personally use something called CertBot, which is a way of getting free certificates for web servers. And CertBot, ha and there's a link to it in the Jobs and UI page, but CertBot has links explaining how to install it. They usually have quick installers that will automatically install encryption for you. And that's probably the best way to get going on the open internet, actually. So yeah, hopefully uh, this video has contained enough information, although it's a little bit waffly, has contained enough information for you to get uh, jobs and jobs and UI server running. If I wasn't very clear in this video, because I'm not very well practiced at making videos, what I'd recommend is that you 
regularly consult the main jobs and read me page it's continually being updated as i hear more feedback from people so even if it's just a comment on youtube where you say oh that isn't very clear or how do i get this working i'll usually read that respond to the comment but also attempt to update the documentation to reflect the fact that maybe something wasn't very clear so please keep the feedback coming in even if it's just a comment on reddit or youtube and the same goes for the jobs and UI. So this guide should hopefully give you enough information to set up a jobs and UI. But if something's not very clear and uh, just say, and I will try and update the documentation as I get along. So yeah, hopefully this is enough information for people to start setting up their own jobs and deployments, which will help me out tremendously. Because hopefully as you start to run your own jobs and deployment, you'll find that there's things that you want that aren't there. And if you find anything like that, just please leave some feedback and I will try to add it. So yeah, I look forward to people trying this out and uh, I look forward to, to hearing from you and uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to hopefully make some more videos in the future. Thank you.